Here, people are free to do the things they want to do. Free for all those small, personal pleasures of home life. In the evening, the farmhouse kitchen and the town sitting room become the centers of family life. Mother, father and the children are home for high tea. Throughout the week, they've been separated. But today, they're together and can enjoy the unity of family life. His home, broken up by his illness, was established again. His self-respect was regained with his earning power. He has a full-time job and, reunited with his family, leads a normal life like millions of fit men all over the country. Here they are. Their name is Brown, and they've just finished breakfast. This is Billy. He's four and has only just started school. This is Mary. She's 11 and old enough to think her hood vastly unbecoming. John is nearly 13, and at the moment, aeroplanes are his chief interest in life. Hurry up, says Mary. You always start messing about when it's time to go to school. Don't forget to put your scarf on when you come home today, says Mother. It's very cold. Billy's school is for children between the ages of four and seven. It's newly built and is a pleasant place in which to learn or teach. Billy, as a matter of fact, hardly knows that he's learning anything. But in four weeks, he has actually learned quite a lot. He's learned to hang up his clothes on his own peg, for instance. He knows it's his peg because of that chicken painted above it. Every child has a different symbol to tell him which is his mug and toothbrush and towel. Every day, even the tiniest children learn the simple habits of hygiene. These are first steps in that character training. The hook on which he hangs his towel is a peg, perhaps, on which Billy will learn to hang many other important things, too. Games, such as the sandpit, help the children to develop their team spirit. And, of course, you must always leave things tidy for those who come after you. And the slide, too, helps to train decent members of the community. Here, you go back and wait your turn. The teachers are setting Billy and his friends to work on various occupations. This isn't just haphazard play, it's a method by which the children acquire all sorts of experiences as a background to reading, writing and numbers. They learn to express themselves in paint and chalk. And above all, they learn to concentrate. Look at this study in concentration. We know that three holes won't fit on four prongs. But when you're this age, you just have to find out. The teachers keep a careful watch on the development of each individual. When a child can readily recognize different shapes, he's ready to tackle that collection of 26 different shapes we call the alphabet. In the next class, they're reading in groups. Said the rabbit, sit on my tail and go with me to my ha rabbit hutch. But to little girl would know. Oh, no, wasn't she naughty? Yes, now then, uh, Kenneth. In the Violinda class, children of five and six learn to express rhythm and music with their fingers. this light department, science plays a different but equally important part. Here, artificial rays of various types are used to combat skin diseases and other ailments. Finson arc combats some types of disease. Tungsten arc, others, particularly tubercular glands.
radiant heat channel turns up paralyzed muscles. Does he feel toned up? So Billy and the other children at the infant school, while learning to approach the primary skill of reading, writing and arithmetic, are also learning how to be members of a community, how to know good from evil, to be thoughtful for others. And their bodies are growing strong and healthy in happy surroundings. It's playtime now, and it's also playtime at the junior school across the road where we shall find Mary. Teachers are out in the playground joining in the children's games. The junior school is for children from 7 to 11. Here, the British idea of character training the boys receive finds practical use in repairing school property, such as chairs or desks, besides making articles to take home. Meanwhile, another class is out in the school grounds, receiving practical instruction in pruning trees. All the produce grown is for use in the school, flowers for decoration or vegetables for the kitchen. Girls are taught all branches of home management in a room plentifully equipped with cookers, sinks and store cupboards. Gas and electrical appliances aim at reproducing all the conditions they're likely to encounter in their future life. And just as boys and girls are separated to learn their own special jobs in life, so at this school they're taught to mix together free from self-consciousness. The children choose their own leaders for games and gym by which their bodies as well as their minds are enriched. To assess the value of oral teaching for the deaf, you must remember that in the very near past, Many of these children would have grown up to be dumb as well. By oral teaching, many deaf children, particularly the partially deaf, are encouraged to try and recover the full use of their voice. This is very important because in the past, the partially deaf child, through being backward in speech and apparently slow in understanding, was often grossly misunderstood and treated as being unusually stupid or troublesome, or even mentally deficient. One thing is now clear. Less than 50 years ago, very few of these children whom you see here would be talking. Still less would they be singing and dancing as they are today. We can all help in this work. A little sympathy and understanding for those whom we know to be deaf is in itself sufficient to spur them on to greater efforts and thereby help them further in their triumph over deafness. Mother finishes her last job of the evening and enjoys it as much as her children do. It is within these family surroundings that children and their parents learn to appreciate the values of human associations. It is here that they learn the give and take of living with others, consideration, tolerance, unselfishness and generosity. A point to remember. Some kids have more self-confidence than some grown men and women. Or to know when boys scrapping can safely be ignored and when they need breaking up promptly to save juvenile black eyes. Another point. Better appeal to fair play than talk technicalities about breaches of the peace.
piece and another. I seem to remember strapping myself once. If you keep pedestrians waiting too long, they'll have to take their lives in their hands and make a dash for it. Some of them like an escort. Well, it had played its part in that purpose, and we'd found it not enough. The houses were built as shelters for the labor needed in industry, not as homes for human beings to grow in. Well, that's simple. First of all, there's the park, laid out and maintained by public money. Here, the kiddies have their swings and roundabouts and can play in safety away from the roads. By the way, the number of babies born in our town is higher than the average in Great Britain. We're a pretty healthy people. Children like the idea. A park without railings reminds them of the open country. In 1942, even children helped with the salvage campaigns. No petrol to waste means holidays at home. And this summer, all the fun of the fair was brought right into the heart of London. Surrounded by the red roofs of Londoner's homes is Kew Gardens. It's a world garden, for in it grow flowers and shrubs and trees from every country in the world. It's also a playground where Londoners seeking a moment of release from war and work may rest while their children play. children, the open country holds a magic promise of adventure. In the fresh air and sunlight beyond the ancient lanes, they can play in a world of their own. The evacuation. That stupendous undertaking of those grave September days being now an accomplished fact, we find children sampling the adventure of life in new homes which the hospitality of country people has provided for them. Some are entertained in big palatial houses with old family servants as well as great ladies to play with them, to read them stories and attend to the babies. Some are received in more humble but intimate homes where their host may be an ex-soldier or for that matter an ex-sailor of the last war. There are other aspects of evacuation. Winter is more rigorous in the country and we all know what kind of a winter 1939 to 1940 was. For the issue of warmer clothes, supply depots are set up in every district. At the same time they see to it that each child has a gas mask. The small illnesses of childhood are taken care of by sick bays often just empty houses converted by the local WVS. Then for the visits of parents to evacuated youngsters, a new idea has been started. The happy little family, reunited for the day, base their activities on a Sunday club in the reception area where they find a canteen provided. 
A similar idea is the communal dining room, where children are billeted on foster parents who go out to work. The midday meal is provided for them by institutions like this. And you may note that helpfulness and thoughtfulness are not the qualities only of those who wait on the children. Yes, air raids on the towns of Britain might have happened within a few hours of war beginning. May have happened by the time you see this. May happen at any time. Let's keep that well in front of our minds when we think of this queer new business of evacuation that's rooted up so many people and put them down in unfamiliar places. Within 48 hours of war, a million children were miles away from their homes in the comparative safety of the reception areas. What a moving job. And just think what far-reaching consequences it may have. Consequences that perhaps very few of us today are able to foresee. For this is by far the greatest experiment of the kind that has ever been undertaken in any country. Here we have this vast army of children. The citizens let us hope of a happier world of tomorrow, taken from the streets of the towns and transplanted into the simpler, healthier life of the country. A sudden reversal of all that has been going on since our industrial age began. A million children moved and not one casualty. But getting them away was one thing. Sorting them out and fixing them up in their new billets, well, as you can guess, that was even harder. First, they were all taken to one place in each town or village to be sorted out. There they were, children of all shapes and sizes from all sorts of homes. Misfits. Yes, there were misfits and plenty. Difficulties, troubles, simply hopeless cases. Some of the country folks said an air raid itself couldn't have been much worse. And of course, it only needed one or two unruly ones to get a whole village full of that name. Well, you know the old saying about idle hands and mischief. Of course, they got into mischief now and again. Didn't you, when you were young? But after all, it wasn't too easy for the youngsters either. Suddenly rooted up and planked down among strangers. Of course, they got up to mischief. What child wouldn't? And there were plenty of apples on the trees. Some of the toddler's mothers found country life a bit lonely too. You know, no movies, no neighbors, no shops. Took a bit of sticking out those first few days. Yes, difficulties there were by the score. But all concerned have a good cause to remember this wartime evacuation with pride. Because in overcoming those difficulties, they've given so wonderful a demonstration of kindliness and good neighborliness. How can we ever praise enough the wonderful welcome that so many hundreds of thousands of kindly country people have shown to these town children? They couldn't have been sweeter to the children if they'd been their own. Time after time, this has been truly said. Homely folk, most of them, like you and me, they buckled to and overcame difficulties that would have tried anyone's patience. This good soul already had four evacuees in her home when the billeting officer told her that they were having trouble in fixing up another youngster. So she made it five. She's still smiling. Children found themselves in homes of every kind, but wherever they went, most of them were soon settled down in their new surroundings. Shyness didn't last long, whether they found themselves in country mansion or in laborer's cottage. Women's Voluntary Services, organized through the Women's Institutes, the Girl Guides, and other national organizations, over 120,000 helpers. Sewing, making men parties, hard at it. Sorting clothes and boots kindly given by people for the children whose parents can't afford them. 
I am badly they were needed by some who had been brought from the slum and districts of the towns. Country lanes call for different clothes to city streets, especially with the winter coming on. And the people in the reception areas did everything possible so that their young visitors should be warmly clad. What hard work it all meant. Committees were busy everywhere, solving new difficulties every day. One of the problems were the visiting relatives. One woman with four evacuees had 17 of their relations turn up one weekend. Now, in many places, helpers have taken over village halls where parents and children can have a cup of tea and be together. And provided someone to look after the baby while the clothes were being scrubbed. Toys, too, have been begged and borrowed from neighbors to help to keep the children entertained. In some places, evening dances and games are got up for the older children. Of course, the children love it. And it's a great help to the foster parents, especially in the smaller homes, to have them off their hands, even if it's only for one evening a week. Another splendid piece of voluntary work is being done in many places. Local volunteers, many of whom had given up their spare time to take special courses before war broke out, help cook and serve meals. In this village, they serve 170 lunches every day. And they certainly seem to have got some good customers. 50 of the children you see here, by the way, are having kosher meals. They are refugee Jewish children who are finding in this English village simple kindliness and common humanity. Meals for mothers, too, are provided for a few pennies every day, and this also helps to relieve the strain on the village people's own kitchens. Here is one of the emergency hospitals. When the town child goes into the country not knowing one kind of berry from another, you can guess what happens. Amongst those who were moved were blind, invalid, and delicate children. These youngsters, for example, are all from special schools. Here they are having the time of their lives at one of the big seaside holiday camps that the government took over for them. A bit better, this, than cramped streets and smoky chimney pots. And, yes, the all-important business of being born didn't stop, either. All these young heroes had to choose this particular time to make their appearance into the world. In all, 3,500 evacuee babies were born during the first six weeks. <laughs> Happiest of all, of course, were the toddlers. Some of them were looked after in big country houses turned into nursery centers with resident nurses and teachers. A joy to look at them, isn't it? Surely it's the sanest, healthiest sight left in the world. A group of children at play. This one thing alone would make evacuation well worthwhile. For it not only means that the youngsters are taken bodily out of harm's way, but that they may still know nothing but the happiness of childhood. If only it didn't take a war to enable these children to know the joys of the open air, to see the flowers, the trees, and the birds. Will they remember it wistfully as a lovely holiday? Or will it make them determined later on to get away from bricks and mortar?
and even school under these new conditions isn't half bad. Lots of the teachers are making the most of the opportunity for the children's benefit, teaching them about the places they're living in and the fascinating life of the countryside. Will they ever forget these lessons? Every week an hour is set aside for writing letters home and what adventures they have to tell. Dear Mum and Dad, Thank you so much for the postal order. This morning I went on a horse to Westwood Farm. The horse's name is Prince. Dear Mum, I'm sorry for not writing for a long time. Well, I have moved to the new place. The lady is very nice. I have got an eider down on my bed. There are four other children there. The boy is called John. He is older than me. There are two little girls. We have been playing on the haystack again. The people do not mind. They say, will you send us some Wellingtons, as it will be very wet. We go to school in the morning, and in the afternoon, we play games. I like the afternoons best. Give my love to Dad. Lots of the children are in large houses, right away from schools, including some of the loveliest old country houses in Britain. Their minds are developing in new surroundings. Here, one of the rooms of the house has become the classroom. It's hard work for the teachers in these new boarding schools. Many of them have to act as foster parents as well. But the best classroom of all, when the weather is fine, is outdoors. After all, real trees and animals and buildings are better than any the teacher can draw on the blackboard to the parents who've put their duty to their children first. And above all, to those great-hearted folk in country towns and villages who are doing all they humanly can to help others at this time of need. It's due to them that over half a million children are now settled in wartime homes outside Britain's danger areas. Thus, the urgent problem of the present is being met. And what of the future? Who can doubt that out of this vast migration of town children to rural areas, great good will come in the years ahead? Who can doubt that all this comradeship and self-sacrifice will result in friendships and happy memories that will remain when the grim realities of today are past? Already, fresh air, good food, and regular hours are working wonders. The children are gaining in weight. They're fitter, stronger, more alert. They're gaining experience that will benefit them all their lives. They're learning the pleasures that only begin where the city pavements end. Our towns have become too big, too crowded. For years, sensible people have said it. It may be that in getting together to master this vast wartime problem, we've taken a bigger step than we know towards happier living when they are there.